Section 7 of The Expression of the Emotions in Man and Animals. Chapter 4, Means of Expression in Animals, Part 1. The Emission of Sounds, Vocal Sounds, Sounds Otherwise Produced. Erection of the Dermal Appendages, Hair, Feathers, etc., Under the Emotions of Anger and Terror. The Drawing Back of the Ears as a Preparation for Fighting and as an Expression of Anger. Erection of the ears and raising the head, a sign of attention. In this and the following chapter I will describe, but only in sufficient detail to illustrate my subject, the expressive movements, under different states of the mind, of some few well-known animals. But before considering them in due succession, it will save much useless repetition to discuss certain means of expression common to most of them. The Emission of Sounds with many kinds of animals, man included, the vocal organs are efficient in the highest degree as a means of expression. We have seen in the last chapter that when the sensorium is strongly excited, the muscles of the body are generally thrown into violent action, and as a consequence, local sounds are uttered, however silent the animal may generally be, and although the sounds may be of no use. Hares and rabbits, for instance, never, I believe, use their vocal organs except in the extremity of suffering, as when a wounded hare is killed by the sportsman, or when a young rabbit is caught by a stoat. Cattle and horses suffer great pain in silence, but when this is excessive, and especially when associated with terror, they utter fearful sounds. I have often recognized, from a distance on the pampas, the agonized death bellow of the cattle when caught by the lasso and hamstrung. It is said that horses, when attacked by wolves, utter loud and peculiar screams of distress. Involuntary and purposeless contractions of the muscles of the chest and glottis, excited in the above manner, may have first given rise to the emission of vocal sounds. But the voice is now largely used by many animals for various purposes. The habit seems to have played an important part in its employment other under circumstances. Naturalists have remarked, I believe with truth, that social animals, from habitually using their vocal organs as a means of intercommunication, use them on other occasions much more freely than other animals. But there are marked exceptions to this rule, for instance with the rabbit. The principle also of association, which is so widely extended in its power, has likewise played its part. Hence it follows that the voice, from having been habitually employed as a serviceable aid under certain conditions, including pleasure, pain, rage, etc., is commonly used whenever the same sensations or emotions are excited under quite different conditions or in a lesser degree. The sexes of many animals incessantly call to each other during the breeding season, and in not a few cases, the male endeavors thus to charm or excite the female. This, indeed, seems to have been the primeval use and means of development of the voice, as I have attempted to show in my Descent of Man. Thus, the use of the vocal organs will have become associated with the anticipation of the strongest pleasure which animals are capable of feeling. Animals which live in society often call to each other when separated, and evidently feel much joy at meeting, as we shall see with a horse on the return of his companion, for whom he has been neighing. The mother calls incessantly for her lost young ones, for instance a cow for her calf, and the young of many animals call for their mothers. When a flock of sheep is scattered, the ewes bleat incessantly for their lambs, and their mutual pleasure at coming together is manifest. Woe betide the man who meddles with the young of the larger and fiercer quadrupeds if they hear the cry of distress from their young. Rage leads to the violent exertion of all the muscles, including those of the voice, and some animals, when enraged, endeavor to strike terror into their enemies by its power and harshness, as the lion does by roaring and the dog by growling. I infer that their object is to strike terror, because the lion at the same time erects the hair of its mane, and the dog the hair along its back, and thus they make themselves appear as large and terrible as possible. Rival males try to excel and challenge each other by their voices, and this leads to deadly contests. Thus the use of the voice will have become associated with the emotion of anger, however it may be aroused. We have also seen that intense pain 
like rage leads to violent outcries and the exertion of screaming by itself gives some relief and thus the use of the voice will have become associated with suffering of any kind the cause of widely different sounds being uttered under different emotions and sensations is a very obscure subject nor does the rule always hold good that there is any marked difference for instance with the dog the bark of anger and that of joy do not differ much though they can be distinguished it is not probable that any precise explanation of the cause or source of each particular sound under different states of mind will ever be given we know that some animals after being domesticated have acquired the habit of uttering sounds which were not natural to them thus domestic dogs and even tamed jackals have learned to bark which is a noise not proper to any species of the genus with the exception of the canis iatrans of north america which is said to bark some breeds also of the domestic pigeon have learned to coo in a new and quite peculiar manner the character of the human voice under the influence of various emotions has been discussed by mr herbert spencer in his interesting essay on music he clearly shows that the voice alters much under different conditions in loudness and in quality that is in resonance and timbre in pitch and intervals no one can listen to an eloquent orator or preacher or to a man calling angrily to another or to one expressing astonishment without being struck with the truth of mr spencer's remarks it is curious how early in life the modulation of the voice becomes expressive with one of my children under the age of two years i clearly perceived that his humph of assent was rendered by a slight modulation strongly emphatic and that by a peculiar whine his negative expressed obstinate determination mr spencer further shows that emotional speech in all the above respects is intimately related to vocal music and consequently to instrumental music and he attempts to explain the characteristic qualities of both on physiological grounds namely quote, on the general law that a feeling is a stimulus to muscular action end quote. it may be admitted that the voice is affected through this law but the explanation appears to me too general and vague to throw much light on the various differences with the exception of that loudness being ordinary speech and emotional speech or singing this remark holds good whether we believe that the various qualities of the voice originated in speaking under the excitement of strong feelings and that these qualities have subsequently been transferred to vocal music or whether we believe as i maintain that the habit of uttering musical sounds was first developed as a means of courtship in the early progenitors of man and thus became associated with the strongest emotions of which they were capable namely ardent love rivalry and triumph that animals utter musical notes is familiar to every one as we may daily hear in the singing of birds it is a more remarkable fact that an ape one of the gibbons produces an exact octave of musical sounds ascending and descending the scale by half tones so that this monkey alone of brute mammals may be said to sing from this fact and from the analogy of other animals i have been led to infer that the progenitors of man probably uttered musical tones before they acquired the power of articulate speech and that consequently when the voice is used under any strong emotion it tends to assume through the principle of association a musical character we can plainly perceive with some of the lower animals that the males employ their voices to please the females and that they themselves take pleasure in their own vocal utterances but why particular sounds are uttered and why these give pleasure cannot at present be explained that the pitch of the voice bears some relation to certain states of feeling is tolerably clear a person gently complaining of ill treatment or slightly suffering almost always speaks in a high-pitched voice dogs when a little impatient often make a high piping note through their noses which at once strike us as plaintive but how difficult it is to know whether the sound is essentially plaintive or only appears so in this particular case from our having learnt by experience what it means ringer states that the monkeys cebus azaro which he kept in paraguay expressed astonishment by a half piping half snarling noise anger or impatience by repeating the sound who who 
in a deeper grunting voice and fright or pain by shrill screams on the other hand with mankind deep groans and high piercing screams equally express an agony of pain laughter may be either high or low so that with adult men as haller long ago remarked the sound partakes of the character of the vowels as pronounced in german o and a whilst the children and women it has more character of e and i and these latter vowel sounds naturally have as helmholtz has shown a higher pitch than the former yet both tones of laughter equally express enjoyment or amusement in considering the mode in which vocal utterances express emotion we are naturally led to inquire into the cause of what is called expression in music upon this point mr litchfield who has long attended to the subject of music has been so kind as to give me the following remarks Quote, the question what is the essence of musical expression involves a number of obscure points which so far as i am aware are as yet unresolved enigmas up to a certain point however any law which is found to hold as to the expression of the emotions by simple sounds must apply to the more developed mode of expression in song which may be taken as the primary type of all music a great part of the emotional effect of a song depends on the character of the action by which the sounds are produced in songs for instance which express great vehemence of passion the effect often chiefly depends on the forcible utterance of some one or two characteristic passages which demand great exertion of vocal force and it will be frequently noticed that a song of this character fails of its proper effect when sung by a voice of sufficient power and range to give the characteristic passages without much exertion this is no doubt the secret of the loss of effect so often produced by the transposition of a song from one key to another the effect is thus seen to depend not merely on the actual sounds but also in part on the nature of the action which produces the sounds indeed it is obvious that whenever we feel the expression of a song to be due to its quickness or slowness of movement to smoothness of flow loudness of utterance and so on we are in fact interpreting the muscular actions which produce sound in the same way in which we interpret muscular action generally but this leaves unexplained the more subtle and more specific effect which we call the musical expression of the song the delight given by its melody or even by the separate sounds which make up the melody this is an effect indefinable in language one which so far as i am aware no one has been able to analyze and which the ingenious speculation of mr herbert spencer as to the origin of music leaves quite unexplained for it is certain that a melodic effect of a series of sounds does not depend in the least on their loudness or softness or on their absolute pitch a tune is always the same tune whether it is sung loudly or softly by a child or a man whether it is played on a flute or on a trombone the purely musical effect of any sound depends on its place in what is technically called a scale the same sound producing absolutely different effects on the ear according as it is heard in connection with one or another series of sounds it is on this relative association of the sounds that all the essentially characteristic effects which are summed up in the phrase musical expression depend but why certain associations of sounds have such and such effects is a problem which yet remains to be solved these effects must indeed in some way or other be connected with the well-known arithmetical relations between the rates of vibration of the sounds which form the musical scale and it is possible but this is merely a suggestion that the greater or less mechanical facility with which the vibrating apparatus of the human larynx passes from one state of vibration to another may have been a primary cause of the greater or lesser pleasure produced by various sequences of sounds but leaving aside these complex questions and confining ourselves to the simpler sounds we can at least see some reasons for the association of certain kinds of sounds with certain states of mind a scream for instance uttered by a young animal or by one of the members of a community as a call for assistance will naturally be loud prolonged and high so as to penetrate to a distance for Hemholtz has shown that 
owing to the shape of the internal cavity of the human ear and its consequent power of resonance high notes produce a particularly strong impression when male animals utter sounds in order to please the females they would naturally employ those which are sweet to the ears of the species and it appears that the same sounds are often pleasing to widely different animals owing to the similarity of their nervous systems as we ourselves perceive in the singing of birds and even in the chirping of certain tree frogs giving us pleasure on the other hand sounds produced in order to strike terror into an enemy would naturally be harsh or displeasing whether the principle of antithesis has come into play with sounds as might perhaps have been expected is doubtful the interrupted laughing or tittering sounds made by man and by various kinds of monkeys when pleased are as different as possible from the prolonged screams of these animals when distressed the deep grunt of satisfaction uttered by a pig when pleased with its food is widely different from its harsh scream of pain or terror but with the dog as lately remarked the bark of anger and that of joy are sounds which by no means stand in opposition to each other and so it is in some other cases there is another obscure point namely whether the sounds which are produced under various states of the mind determine the shape of the mouth or whether its shape is not determined by independent causes and the sound thus modified when young infants cry they open their mouths widely and this no doubt is necessary for pouring forth a full volume of sound but the mouth then assumes from a quite distinct cause an almost quadrilateral shape depending as will hereafter be explained on the firm closing of the eyelids and consequent drawing up of the upper lip how far this square shape of the mouth modifies the wailing or crying sound i am not prepared to say but we know from the researches of hemholtz and others that the form of the cavity of the mouth and lips determines the nature and pitch of the vowel sounds which are produced it will also be shown in a future chapter that under the feeling of contempt or disgust there is a tendency from intelligible causes to blow out of the mouth or nostrils and this produces sounds like pooh or pish when any one is startled or suddenly astonished there is an instantaneous tendency likewise from an intelligible cause namely to be ready for prolonged exertion to open the mouth widely so as to draw a deep and rapid inspiration when the next full expiration follows the mouth is slightly closed and the lips from causes hereafter to be discussed are somewhat protruded and this form of the mouth if the voice be at all exerted produces according to hemholtz the sound of the vowel o oh. certainly a deep sound of the prolonged o oh may be heard from a whole crowd of people immediately after witnessing any astonishing spectacle if together with surprise pain be felt there is a tendency to contract all the muscles of the body including those of the face and the lips will then be drawn back and this will perhaps account for the sound becoming higher and assuming the character of ah or ach as fear causes all the muscles of the body to tremble the voice naturally becomes tremulous and at the same time husky from the dryness of the mouth owing to the salivary glands failing to act why the laughter of man and the tittering of monkeys should be a rapidly reiterated sound cannot be explained during the utterance of these sounds the mouth is transversely elongated by the corners being drawn backwards and upwards and of this fact an explanation will be attempted in a future chapter but the whole subject of the differences of the sounds produced under different states of mind is so obscure that i have succeeded in throwing hardly any light on it and the remarks which i have made have but little significance all the sounds hitherto noticed depend on the respiratory organs but sounds produced by wholly different means are likewise expressive rabbits stamp loudly on the ground as a signal to their comrades and if a man knows how to do so properly he may on a quiet evening hear the rabbits answering him all around these animals as well as some others also stamp on the ground when made angry porcupines rattle their quills and vibrate their tails when angered and one behaved in this manner when a live snake was placed in its compartment 
the quills on the tail are very different from those on the body they are short hollow thin like a goose quill with their ends traversely truncated so that they are open they are supported on long thin elastic footstalks now when the tail is rapidly shaken these hollow quills strike against each other and produce as i heard in the presence of mr bartlett a peculiar continuous sound we can i think understand why porcupines have been provided through the modification of their protective spines with this special sound producing instrument they are nocturnal animals and if they scented or heard a prowling beast of prey it would be a great advantage to them in the dark to give warning to their enemy what they were and that they were furnished with dangerous spines they would thus escape being attacked they are as i may add so fully conscious of the power of their weapons that when they are enraged they will charge backwards with their spines erected yet still inclined backwards many birds during their courtship produce diversified sounds by means of specially adapted feathers storks when excited make a loud clattering noise with their beaks some snakes produce a grating or a rattling noise many insects stridulate by rubbing together specifically modified parts of their hard integuments this stridulation generally serves as a sexual charm or call but it is likewise used to express different emotions everyone who has attended to bees knows that their humming changes when they are angry and this serves as a warning that there is danger of being stung i have made these few remarks because some writers have laid so much stress on the vocal and respiratory organs as having been specially adapted for expression that it was advisable to show that sounds otherwise produced serve equally well for the same purpose erection of the dermal appendages hardly any expressive movement is so general as the involuntary erection of the hairs feathers or other dermal appendages for it is common throughout three of the great vertebrate classes these appendages are erected under the excitement of anger or terror more especially when these emotions are combined or quickly succeed each other the action serves to make the animal appear larger and more frightful to its enemies or rivals and is generally accompanied by various voluntary movements adapted for the same purpose and by the utterance of savage sounds mr bartlett who has had such wide experience with animals of all kinds does not doubt that this is the case but it is a different question whether the power of erection was primarily acquired for this special purpose i will first give a considerable body of facts showing how general this action is with mammals birds and reptiles retaining what i have to say in regard to man for a future chapter mr sutton the intelligent keeper in the zoological gardens carefully observed for me the chimpanzee and orang and he states that when they are suddenly frightened as by a thunderstorm or when they are made angry as by being teased their hair becomes erect I saw a chimpanzee who was alarmed at the sight of a black coal heaver, and the hair rose all over his body. He made little starts forward as if to attack the man, without any real intention of doing so, but with the hope, as the keeper remarked, of frightening him. The gorilla, when enraged, is described by Mr. Ford as having his crest of hair, quote, erect and projecting forward, his nostrils dilated, and his underlip thrown down, at the same time uttering his characteristic yell, designed, it would seem, to terrify his antagonists, end quote. I saw the hair on the Anubis baboon, when angered, bristling along the back, from the neck to the loins, but not on the rump or other parts of the body. I took a stuffed snake into the monkey house, and the hair on several of the species instantly became erect, especially on their tails, as I particularly noted with the Cereopithecus nictitans. Brehm states that the Midas Oedipus, belonging to the American division, when excited erects its mane in order, as he adds, to make itself as frightful as possible with the carnivora the erection of the hair seems to be almost universal often accompanied by threatening movements the uncovering of the teeth and the utterance of savage growls in the herpestes i have seen the hair on end over nearly the whole body including the tail and the dorsal crest is erected in a conspicuous manner by the hyena and the protellus the enraged lion erects his mane the bristling of the hair along the neck and back of the dog and over the whole body of the cat 
especially on the tail, is familiar to everyone. With the cat it apparently occurs only under fear, with the dog under anger and fear, but not, as far as I have observed, under abject fear, as when the dog is going to be flogged by a severe gamekeeper. If, however, the dog shows fight, as sometimes happens, up goes his hair. I have often noticed that the hair of a dog is particularly liable to rise if he is half angry and half afraid, as on beholding some object only indistinctly seen in the dusk. I have been assured by a veterinary surgeon that he has often seen the hair erected on horses and cattle on which he had operated and was again going to operate. When I showed the stuffed snake to the peccary, the hair rose in a wonderful manner along its back, and so it does with the boar when enraged. An elk which gored a man to death in the United States is described as first brandishing his antlers, squealing with rage and stamping on the ground. Quote, At length his hair was seen to rise and stand on end, end quote, and then he plunged forward to the attack. The hair likewise becomes erect on goats, and as I hear from Mr. Blythe on some Indian antelopes. I have seen it erected on the hairy anteater and on the agouti, one of the rodents. A female bat, which reared her young under confinement, when anyone looked into the cage, quote, erected the fur on her back and bit viciously at intruding fingers, end quote. Birds belonging to all the chief orders ruffle their feathers when angry or frightened. Everyone must have seen two cocks, even quite young birds, preparing to fight with erected neck hackles, nor can these feathers when erected serve as a means of defense, for cockfighters have found by experience that it is advantageous to trim them. The male ruff, Machetes pugnax, likewise erects its collar of feathers when fighting. When a dog approaches a common hen with her chickens, she spreads out her wings, raises her tail, ruffles all her feathers, and looking as ferocious as possible, dashes at the intruder. The tail is not always held in exactly the same position. It is sometimes so much erected that the central feathers, as in the accompanying drawing, almost touch the back. Swans, when angered, likewise raise their wings and tail and erect their feathers. They open their beaks and make, by paddling little rapid starts forwards, against anyone who approaches the water's edge too closely. Tropic birds, when disturbed on their nests, are said not to fly away, but, quote, merely to stick out their feathers and scream, end quote. The barn owl, when approached, Quote, instantly swells out its plumage, extends its wings and tail, hisses and clacks its mandibles with force and rapidity. End quote. So do other kinds of owls. Hawks, as I am informed by Mr. Jenner Weir, likewise ruffle their feathers and spread out their wings and tail under similar circumstances. Some kinds of parrots erect their feathers, and I have seen this action in the cassowary when angered at the sight of an anteater. Young cuckoos in the nest raise their feathers, open their mouths widely, and make themselves as frightful as possible. Small birds also, as I hear from Mr. Weir, such as various finches, buntings, and warblers, when angry, ruffle all their feathers, or only those around the neck, or they spread out their wings and tail feathers. With the plumage in this state, they rush at each other with open beaks and threatening gestures. Mr. Weir concludes from his large experience that the erection of the feathers is caused much more by anger than by fear. He gives as an instance a hybrid goldfinch of a most irascible disposition, which, when approached too closely by a servant, instantly assumes the appearance of a ball of ruffled feathers. He believes that birds, when frightened, as a general rule, closely adpress all their feathers, and their consequently diminished size is often astonishing. As soon as they recover from their fear or surprise, the first thing which they do is shake out their feathers. The best instances of this adpression of the feathers and apparent shrinking of the body from fear, which Mr. Weir has noticed, has been in the quail and grass parakeet. The habit is intelligible in these birds from their being accustomed, when in danger, either to squat on the ground or to sit motionless on a branch so as to escape detection. Though with birds anger may be the chief and commonest cause of the erection of the feathers, it is probable that young cuckoos, when looked at in the nest, and a hen with her chickens when approached by a dog, feel at least some terror. 
Mr. Tegetsmeyer informs me that with gamecocks, the erection of the feathers on the head has long been recognized in the cockpit as a sign of cowardice. The males of some lizards, when fighting together during their courtship, expand their throat pouches or frills and erect their dorsal crests. But Dr. Gunther does not believe that they can erect their separate spines or scales. End of section 7 Section 8 of The Expression of Emotions in Man and Animals Chapter 4, Means of Expression in Animals, Part 2 we thus see how generally throughout the two higher vertebrate classes and with some reptiles the dermal appendages are erected under the influence of anger and fear the movement is affected as we know from colliker's interesting discovery by the contraction of minute unstriped involuntary muscles often called erectores pili which are attached to the capsules of the separate hairs feathers etc by the contraction of these muscles, the hairs can be instantly erected, as we see in a dog, being at the same time drawn a little out of their sockets. They are afterwards quickly depressed. The vast number of these minute muscles over the whole body of a hairy quadruped is astonishing. The erection of the hair is, however, aided in some cases, as with that on the head of a man, by the striped and voluntary muscles of the underlying paniculus carnosus. It is by the action of these latter muscles that the hedgehog erects its spines. It appears also from the researches of Leydig and others that striped fibers extend to the panaculus of some of the larger hairs, such as the vibrissae of certain quadrupeds. The erectores pili contract not only under the above emotions, but from the application of cold to the surface. I remember that my mules and dogs brought from a lower and warmer country, after spending a night on the bleak cordillera, had the hairs all over their bodies as erect as under the greatest terror. We see the same action in our own goose skin during the chill before a fever fit. Mr. Lister has also found that tickling a neighboring part of the skin causes the erection and protrusion of the hairs. From these facts, it is manifest that the erection of the dermal appendages is a reflex action, independent of the will, and this action must be looked at when occurring under the influence of anger or fear, not as a power acquired for the sake of some advantage, but as an incidental result, at least to a large extent, of the sensorium being affected. The result, in as far as it is incidental, may be compared with the profuse sweating from an agony of pain or terror. Nevertheless, it is remarkable how slight an excitement often suffices to cause the hair to become erect, as when two dogs pretend to fight together in play. We have also seen a large number of animals belonging to widely distinct classes that the erection of the hair or feathers is almost always accompanied by various voluntary movements, by threatening gestures, opening the mouth, uncovering the teeth, spreading out of the wings and tail by birds, and by the utterance of harsh sounds. And the purpose of these voluntary movements is unmistakable. Therefore, it seems hardly credible that the coordinated erection of the dermal appendages, by which the animal is made to appear larger and more terrible to its enemies or rivals, should be altogether an incidental or purposeless result of the disturbance of the sensorium. This seems almost as incredible as that the erection by the hedgehog of its spines, or of the quills by the porcupine, or of the ornamental plumes by many birds during their courtship, should all be purposeless actions. We here encounter a great difficulty. How can the contraction of the unstriped and involuntary erectories pili have been coordinated with that of various voluntary muscles for the same purpose? If we could believe that the erectors primordially had been voluntary muscles and had since lost their stripes and become involuntary, the case would be comparatively simple. I am not, however, aware that there is any evidence in favor of this view, although the reversed transition would not have presented any great difficulty, as the voluntary muscles are in an unstriped condition in the embryos of the higher animals and in the larvae of some crustaceans. Moreover, in the deeper layers of the skin of adult birds, the muscular network is, according to Leydig, in a transitional condition. 
the fibres exhibiting only indications of traverse striation. Another explanation seems possible. We may admit that originally the erectoris pili were slightly acted on in a direct manner under the influence of rage and terror by the disturbance of the nervous system, as is undoubtedly the case with our so-called goose skin before a fever fit. Animals have been repeatedly excited by rage and terror during many generations, and consequently the direct effects of the disturbed nervous system on the dermal appendages will almost certainly have been increased through habit and through the tendency of nerve force to pass readily along accustomed channels. We shall find this view of the force of habit strikingly confirmed in a future chapter, where it will be shown that the hair of the insane is affected in an extraordinary manner, owing to their repeated accesses of fury and terror. As soon as with animals the power of erection had thus been strengthened or increased, they must often have seen the hairs or feathers erected in rival and enraged males, and the bulk of their bodies thus increased. In this case, it appears possible that they might have wished to make themselves appear larger and more terrible to their enemies by voluntarily assuming a threatening attitude and uttering harsh cries, such attitudes and utterances after a time becoming through habit instinctive. In this manner, actions performed by the contraction of voluntary muscles might have been combined for the same special purpose with those affected by involuntary muscles. It is even possible that animals, when excited and dimly conscious of some change in the state of their hair, might act on it by repeated exertions of their attention and will. For we have reason to believe that the will is able to influence, in an obscure manner, the action of some unstriped or involuntary muscles, as in the period of the peristaltic movements of the intestines, and in the contraction of the bladder." nor must we overlook the part which variation and natural selection may have played for the males which succeeded in making themselves appear the most terrible to their rivals or to their other enemies if not of overwhelming power will on an average have left more offspring to inherit their characteristic qualities whatever these may be and however first acquired than have other males the inflation of the body and other means of exciting fear in an enemy Certain amphibians and reptiles, which either have no spines to erect or no muscles by which they can be erected, enlarge themselves when alarmed or angry by inhaling air. This is well known to be the case with toads and frogs. The latter animal is made, in Aesop's fable of the ox and the frog, to blow itself up from vanity and envy until it burst. This action must have been observed during the most ancient times, as, according to Mr. Hensley Wedgwood, the word toad expresses in all the languages of Europe the habit of swelling. It has been observed with some of the exotic species in the zoological gardens, and Dr. Gunther believes that it is general throughout the group. Judging from analogy, the primary purpose probably was to make the body appear as large and frightful as possible to an enemy, but another and perhaps more important secondary advantage is thus gained. When frogs are seized by snakes, which are their chief enemies, they enlarge themselves wonderfully, so that if the snake be of small size, as Dr. Gunther informs me, it cannot swallow the frog, which thus escapes being devoured." Chameleons and some other lizards inflate themselves when angry. Thus, a species inhabiting Oregon, the Tapaya de Glassi, is slow in its movements and does not bite, but has a ferocious aspect. When irritated, it springs in a most threatening manner at anything pointed at it, at the same time opening its mouth wide and hissing audibly, after which it inflates its body and shows other marks of anger. Several kinds of snakes likewise inflate themselves when irritated. The puff adder, Clotho aritans, is remarkable in this respect, but I believe, after carefully watching these animals, that they do not act thus for the sake of increasing their apparent bulk, but simply for inhaling a large supply of air, so as to produce their surprisingly loud, harsh, and prolonged hissing sound. 
the cobras de capello when irritated enlarge themselves a little and hiss moderately but at the same time they lift their heads aloft and dilate by means of their elongated anterior ribs the skin on each side of the neck into a large flat disc the so-called hood with their widely opened mouths they then assume a terrific aspect the benefit thus derived ought to be considerable in order to compensate for the somewhat lessened rapidity though this is still great with which when dilated they can strike at their enemies or prey on the same principle that a broad thin piece of wood cannot be moved through the air so quickly as a small round stick an innocuous snake the trevidonatus macrophthalamus an inhabitant of india likewise dilates its neck when irritated and consequently is often mistaken for its compatriot the deadly cobra this resemblance perhaps serves as some protection to the trepidonatists. Another innocuous species, the Dazipeltis of South Africa, blows itself out, distends its neck, hisses, and darts at the intruder. Many other snakes hiss under similar circumstances. They also rapidly vibrate their protruded tongues, and this may aid in increasing their terrific appearance snakes possess other means of producing sounds besides hissing many years ago i observed in south america that a venomous trigonocephalus when disturbed rapidly vibrated the end of its tail which striking against the dry grass and twigs produced a rattling noise that could be distinctly heard at the distance of six feet the deadly and fierce echis carinata of india produces a curious prolonged almost hissing sound in a very different manner namely by rubbing the sides of the folds of its body against each other whilst the head remains in almost the same position the scales on the sides and not on other parts of the body are strongly keeled with the keels toothed like a saw and as the coiled up animal rubs its sides together these grate against each other lastly we have the well-known case of the rattlesnake he who has merely shaken the rattle of a dead snake can form no just idea of the sound produced by the living animal professor schaller states that it is indistinguishable from that made by the male of the large cicada and homopterous insect which inhabits the same district in the zoological gardens when the rattlesnakes and puff adders were greatly excited at the same time i was much struck at the similarity of the sound produced by them and although that made by the rattlesnake is louder and shriller than the hissing of the puff adder yet when standing at some yards distance i could scarcely distinguish the two for whatever purpose the sound is produced by the one species i can hardly doubt that it serves for the same purpose in the other species and i conclude from the threatening gestures made at the time by many snakes that their hissing the rattling of the rattlesnake and of the tail of the trigonocephalus the grating of the scales of the etches and the dilation of the hood of the cobra all subserve the same end namely to make them appear terrible to their enemies it seems at first a probable conclusion that venomous snakes such as the foregoing from being already so well defended by their poison fangs would never be attacked by any enemy and consequently would have no need to excite additional terror but this is far from being the case for they are largely preyed on in all quarters of the world by many animals it is well known that pigs are employed in the united states to clear districts infested with rattlesnakes which they do most effectually in england the hedgehog attacks and devours the viper in india as i hear from dr jordan several kinds of hawks and at least one mammal the herpestes kill cobras and other venomous species and so it is in south africa therefore it is by no means improbable that any sounds or signs by which the venomous species could instantly make themselves recognized as dangerous would be of more service to them than to the innocuous species which would not be able if attacked to inflict any real injury having said thus much about snakes i am tempted to add a few remarks on the means by which the rattle of the rattlesnake was probably developed various animals including some lizards either curl or vibrate their tails when excited this is the case with many kinds of snakes in the zoological gardens an innocuous species the coronella sei vibrates its tail so rapidly that it becomes almost invisible the trigonocephalus before alluded to has the same habit and the extremity of its tail is a little enlarged or ends in a bead 
in the lachesis which is so closely allied to the rattlesnake that it was placed by linnaeus in the same genus the tail ends in a single large lancet-shaped point or scale with some snakes the skin as professor schaller remarks quote, is more imperfectly detached from the region about the tail than at any other parts of the body end quote. Now, if we suppose that the end of the tail of some ancient American species was enlarged and was covered by a single large scale, this could hardly have been cast off at the successive molts. In this case, it would have been permanently retained, and at each period of growth, as the snake grew larger, a new scale, larger than the last, would have been formed above it and would likewise have been retained. The foundation for the development of a rattle would thus have been laid, and it would have been habitually used if the species, like so many others, vibrated its tail whenever it was irritated. That the rattle has since been specially developed to serve as an efficient sound-producing instrument, there can hardly be a doubt, for even the vertebra included within the extremity of the tail have been altered in shape and cohere. But there is no greater improbability in various structures, such as the rattle of the rattlesnake, the lateral scales of the etches, the neck with the included ribs of the cobra, and the whole body of the puff adder, having been modified for the sake of warning and frightening away their enemies, than in a bird, namely the wonderful secretary hawk, Gypo Geranus, having had its whole frame modified for the sake of killing snakes with impunity it is highly probable judging from what we have before seen that this bird would ruffle its feathers whenever it attacked a snake and it is certain that the herpestes when it eagerly rushes to attack a snake erects the hair all over its body and especially that on its tail we have also seen that some porcupines, when angered or alarmed at the sight of a snake, rapidly vibrate their tails, thus producing a peculiar sound by the striking together of the hollow quills. So that here both the attackers and the attacked endeavor to make themselves as dreadful as possible to each other, and both possess for this purpose specialized means, which, oddly enough, are nearly the same in some of these cases. Finally, we can see that if, on the one hand, those individual snakes which were best able to frighten their enemies escaped best from being devoured, and if, on the other hand, those individuals of the attacking enemy survived in larger numbers which were the best fitted for the dangerous task of killing and devouring venomous snakes, then, in the one case as in the other, beneficial variations, supposing the characters in question to vary, would commonly have been preserved through the survival of the fittest. The drawing back and pressure of the ears to the head. The ears, through their movements, are highly expressive in many animals, but in some, such as man, the higher apes, and many ruminants, they fail in this respect. A slight difference in position serves to express in the plainest manner a different state of mind, as we may daily see in the dog but we are here concerned only with the ears being drawn closely backward and pressed to the head. A savage frame of mind is thus shown, but only in the case of those animals which fight with their teeth. And the care with which they take to prevent their ears being seized by their antagonists accounts for this position. Consequently, through habit and association, whenever they feel slightly savage or pretend in their play to be savage, their ears are drawn back. That this is the true explanation may be inferred from the relation which exists in very many animals between their manner of fighting and the retraction of their ears. All the carnivora fight with their canine teeth, and all, as far as I have observed, draw their ears back when feeling savage. This may be continually seen with dogs when fighting in earnest, and with puppies fighting in play. The movement is different from the falling down and slight drawing back of the ears when a dog feels pleased and is caressed by his master. The retraction of the ears may likewise be seen in kittens fighting together in their play and in full-grown cats when really savage, as before illustrated in figure 9. Although their ears are thus to a large extent protected, yet they often get much torn in old male cats during their mutual battles. The same movement is very striking in tigers, leopards, etc., whilst growling over their food in menageries. 
the lynx has remarkably long ears and their retraction when one of these animals is approached in its cage is very conspicuous and is eminently expressive of its savage disposition even one of the eared seals the ataria pusilla which has very small ears draws them backwards when it makes a savage rush at the legs of its keeper when horses fight together they use their incisors for biting and their forelegs for striking much more than they do their hind legs for kicking backwards this has been observed when stallions have broken loose and have fought together and may likewise be inferred from the kind of wounds which they inflict on each other every one recognizes the vicious appearance which the drawing back of the ears gives to the horse this movement is very different from that of listening to a sound behind if an ill-tempered horse in a stall is inclined to kick backwards his ears are retracted from habit though he has no intention or power to bite but when the horse throws up both hind legs in play as when entering an open field or when just touched by the whip he does not generally depress his ears for he does not then feel vicious guanacos fight savagely with their teeth and they must do so frequently for i found the hides of several which i shot in patagonia deeply scored so do camels and both these animals when savage draw their ears closely backwards guanacos as i have noticed when not intending to bite but merely to spit their offensive saliva from a distance at an intruder retract their ears even the hippopotamus when threatening with its widely open enormous mouth a comrade draws back its small ears just like a horse now what a contrast is presented between the foregoing animals and cattle sheep or goats which never use their teeth in fighting and never draw back their ears when enraged although sheep and goats appear such placid animals the males often join in furious contests as deer form a closely related family and as i do not know that they ever fought with their teeth i was much surprised at the account given by major ross king of the moose deer in canada he says when quote, two males chance to meet laying back their ears and gnashing their teeth together they rush at each other with appalling fury End quote but mr bartlett informs me that some species of deer fight savagely with their teeth so that the drawing back of the ears by the moose accords with our rule several kinds of kangaroos kept in the zoological gardens fight by scratching with their forefeet and by kicking with their hind legs but they never bite each other and the keepers have never seen them draw back their ears when angered rabbits fight chiefly by kicking and scratching but they likewise bite each other and i have known one to bite off half the tail of its antagonist at the commencement of their battles they lay back their ears but afterwards as they bound over and kick each other they keep their ears erect or move them much about mr bartlett watched a wild boar quarrelling rather savagely with his sow and both had their mouths opened and their ears drawn backwards but this does not appear to be a common action with domestic pigs when quarrelling boars fight together by striking upwards with their tusks and mr bartlett doubts whether they then draw back their ears elephants which in like manner fight with their tusks do not retract their ears but on the contrary erect them when rushing at each other or at an enemy the rhinoceroses in the zoological gardens fight with their nasal horns and have never been seen to attempt biting each other except in play and the keepers are convinced that they do not draw back their ears like horses and dogs when feeling savage the following statement therefore by sir s baker is inexplicable namely that a rhinoceros which he shot in north africa quote, had no ears they had been bitten off close to the head by another of the same species while fighting and this mutilation is by no means uncommon End quote. lastly with respect to monkeys some kinds which have movable ears and which fight with their teeth for instance the seriopithecus ruber draw back their ears when irritated just like dogs and they then have a very spiteful appearance other kinds as the inuus echodatus apparently do not thus act again other kinds and this is a great anomaly in comparison with most other animals retract their ears show their teeth and jabber when they are pleased by being caressed I observed this in two or three species of Macassus and in the Sinopithecus niger. 
this expression owing to our familiarity with dogs would never be recognized as one of joy or pleasure by those unacquainted with monkeys erection of the ears this movement requires hardly any notice all animals which have the power of freely moving their ears when they are startled or when they closely observe an object direct their ears to the point towards which they are looking in order to hear any sound from this quarter at the same time they generally raise their heads as all their organs of sense are there situated and some of the smaller animals rise on their hind legs even those kinds which squat on the ground or instantly flee away to avoid danger generally act momentarily in this manner in order to ascertain the source and nature of the danger the head being raised with erected ears and eyes directed forwards gives an unmistakable expression of close attention to any animal End of section eight section nine of the expression of the emotions in man and animals chapter five special expressions of animals part one the dog i have already described the appearance of a dog approaching another dog with hostile intentions namely with erected ears eyes intently directed forwards hair on the neck and back bristling gait remarkably stiff with the tail upright and rigid so familiar is this appearance to us that an angry man is sometimes said to, quote, have his back up, unquote. Of the above points, the stiff gait and upright tail alone require further discussion. Sir C. Bell remarks that when a tiger or wolf is struck by its keeper and is suddenly roused to ferocity, every muscle is in tension, and the limbs are in an attitude of strained exertion, prepared to spring. This tension of the muscles and consequent stiff gait may be accounted for on the principle of associated habit, for anger has continually led to fierce struggles, and consequently to all the muscles of the body having been violently exerted. There is also reason to suspect that the muscular system requires some short preparation or some degree of innervation before being brought into strong action. My own sensations lead me to this inference, but I cannot discover that it is a conclusion admitted by physiologists. Sir J. Paget, however, informs me that when muscles are suddenly contracted with the greatest force without any preparation, they are liable to be ruptured, as when a man slips unexpectedly, but that this rarely occurs when an action, however violent, is deliberately performed. With respect to the upright position of the tail, it seems to depend, but whether this is really the case I know not, on the elevator muscles being more powerful than the depressors so that when all the muscles of the hinder part of the body are in a state of tension, the tail is raised. A dog in cheerful spirits and trotting before his master with high elastic steps generally carries his tail aloft, though it is not held nearly so stiffly as when he is angered. A horse, when first turned out into an open field, may be seen to trot along with elastic strides, the head and tail being held high aloft. Even cows, when they frisk about from pleasure, throw up their tails in a ridiculous fashion. So it is with various animals in the zoological gardens. The position of the tail, however, in certain cases, is determined by special circumstances. Thus, as soon as a horse breaks into a gallop, at full speed, he always lowers his tail, so that as little resistance as possible may be offered to the air. When a dog is on the point of springing on his antagonist, he utters a savage growl. The ears are pressed closely backwards, and the upper lip is retracted out of the way of his teeth, especially of his canines. These movements may be observed with dogs and puppies in their play, but if a dog gets really savage in his play, his expression immediately changes. This, however, is simply due to the lips and ears being drawn back with much greater energy. If a dog only snarls at another, the lip is generally retracted on one side alone, namely towards his enemy. The movements of a dog whilst exhibiting affection towards his master were described in our second chapter. These consist in the head and whole body being lowered and thrown into flexuous movements, with the tail extended and wagged from side to side. The ears fall down and are drawn somewhat backwards, which causes the eyelids to be elongated and alters the whole appearance of the face. The lips hang loosely and the hair remains smooth. All these movements or gestures are explicable, as I believe, 
from their standing in complete antithesis to those naturally assumed by a savage dog under a directly opposite state of mind. When a man merely speaks to, or just notices, his dog, we see the last vestige of these movements in a slight wag of the tail, without any other movement of the body, and without even the ears being lowered. Dogs always exhibit their affection by desiring to rub against their masters, and to be rubbed or patted by them. Gratiole explains the above gestures of affection in the following manner, and the reader can judge whether the explanation appears satisfactory. Speaking of animals in general, including the dog, he says, quote, C'est toujours la partie la plus sensible de leur corps qui recherche les caresses ou les dents. Lorsque toute la longueur des flancs et du corps est sensible, l'animal serpent est rampe sous les caresses et ses ondulations se propageant le long des muscles analogues des segments jusqu'aux extrémités de la colonne vertébrale, le cœur se ploie et s'agite. Further on, he adds that dogs, when feeling affectionate, lower their ears in order to exclude all sounds, so that their whole attention may be concentrated on the caresses of their master. Dogs have another and striking way of exhibiting their affection, namely by licking the hands or faces of their masters. They sometimes lick other dogs, and then it is always their chops. I have also seen dogs licking cats with whom they were friends. This habit probably originated in the females carefully licking their puppies, the dearest object of their love, for the sake of cleansing them. They also often give their puppies, after a short absence, a few cursory licks, apparently from affection. Thus the habit will have become associated with the emotion of love, however it may afterwards be aroused. It is now so firmly inherited or innate that it is transmitted equally to both sexes. A female terrier of mine lately had her puppies destroyed, and though at all times a very affectionate creature, I was much struck with the manner in which she then tried to satisfy her instinctive maternal love by expending it on me, and her desire to lick my hands rose to an insatiable passion. The same principle probably explains why dogs, when feeling affectionate, like rubbing against their masters or being rubbed or patted by them, for, from the nursing of their puppies, contact with a beloved object has become firmly associated in their minds with the emotion of love. The feeling of affection of a dog towards his master is combined with a strong sense of submission, which is akin to fear. Hence dogs not only lower their bodies and crouch a little as they approach their masters, but sometimes throw themselves on the ground with their bellies upwards. This is a movement as completely opposite as is possible to any show of resistance. I formerly possessed a large dog who was not at all afraid to fight with other dogs, but a wolf-like shepherd dog in the neighborhood, though not ferocious and not so powerful as my dog, had a strange influence over him. When they met on the road, my dog used to run to meet him, with his tail partly tucked in between his legs and hair not erected, and then he would throw himself on the ground, belly upwards. By this action he seemed to say more plainly than by words, Behold, I am your slave. A pleasurable and excited state of mind, associated with affection, is exhibited by some dogs in a very peculiar manner, namely by grinning. This was noticed long ago by Somerville, who says, And with a courtly grin the fawning bound salutes thee cowering. His wide opening nose upward he curls, and his large, slow back eyes melt in soft blandishments and humble joy. The Chase, Book One. Sir W. Scott's famous Scotch greyhound, Maida, had this habit, and it is common with terriers. I have also seen it in a spitz and in a sheepdog. Mr. Riviere, who has particularly attended to this expression, informs me that it is rarely displayed in a perfect manner but is quite common in a lesser degree. The upper lip during the act of grinning is retracted, as in snarling, so that the canines are exposed and the ears are drawn backwards, but the general appearance of the animal clearly shows that anger is not felt. Sir C. Bell remarks, quote, Dogs, in their expression of fondness, have a slight aversion of the lips, and grin and sniff amidst their gambols in a way that resembles laughter. Unquote. Some persons speak of the grin as a smile, but if it had been really a smile, we should see a similar, though more pronounced, movement of the lips and ears when the dogs utter their bark of joy, 
but this is not the case, although a bark of joy often follows a grin. On the other hand, dogs, when playing with their comrades or masters, almost always pretend to bite each other, and they then retract, though not energetically, their lips and ears. Hence I suspect that there is a tendency in some dogs, whenever they feel lively pleasure, combined with affection, to act through habit and association on the same muscles, as in playfully biting each other or their master's hands. I have described in the second chapter the gait and appearance of a dog when cheerful, and the marked antithesis presented by the same animal when dejected and disappointed, with his head, ears, body, tail, and chops drooping, and eyes dull. Under the expectation of any great pleasure, dogs bound and jump about in an extravagant manner, and bark for joy. The tendency to bark under this state of mind is inherited, or runs in the breed. Greyhounds rarely bark, whilst the spitz dog barks so incessantly on starting for a walk with his master that he becomes a nuisance. An agony of pain is expressed by dogs in nearly the same way as by many other animals, namely by howling, writhing, and contortions of the whole body. Attention is shown by the head being raised, with the ears erected, and the eyes intently directed toward the object or quarter under observation. If it be a sound and the source is not known, the head is often turned obliquely from side to side in a most significant manner, apparently in order to judge with more exactness from what point the sound proceeds. But I have seen a dog greatly surprised at a new noise, turning his head to one side through habit, though he clearly perceived the source of the noise. Dogs, as formerly remarked, when their attention is in any way aroused, whilst watching some object or attending to some sound, often lift up one paw, and keep it doubled up, as if to make a slow and stealthy approach. A dog under extreme terror will throw himself down, howl, and void his excretions, but the hair, I believe, does not become erect unless some anger is felt. I have seen a dog much terrified at a band of musicians who were playing loudly outside the house, with every muscle of his body trembling, with his heart palpitating so quickly that the beats could hardly be counted, and panting for breath with widely open mouth, in the same manner as a terrified man does. Yet this dog had not exerted himself. He had only wandered slowly and restlessly about the room, and the day was cold. Even a very slight degree of fear is invariably shown by the tail being tucked in between the legs. This tucking in of the tail is accompanied by the ears being drawn backwards, but they are not pressed closely to the head as in snarling, and they are not lowered as when a dog is pleased or affectionate. When two young dogs chase each other in play, the one that runs away always keeps his tail tucked inwards. So it is when a dog in the highest spirits careers like a mad creature round and round his master in circles or in figures of eight. He then acts as if another dog were chasing him. This curious kind of play, which must be familiar to everyone who has attended to dogs, is particularly apt to be excited after the animal has been a little startled or frightened, as by his master suddenly jumping out on him in the dusk. In this case, as well as when two young dogs are chasing each other in play, it appears as if the one that runs away was afraid of the other catching him by the tail. But as far as I can find out, dogs very rarely catch each other in this manner. I asked a gentleman who had kept foxhounds all his life, and be applied to other experienced sportsmen, whether they had ever seen hounds thus seize a fox. But they never had. It appears that when a dog is chased, or when in danger of being struck behind, or of anything falling on him, in all these cases he wishes to withdraw as quickly as possible his whole hindquarters, and that from some sympathy or connection between the muscles, the tail is then drawn closely inwards. A similarly connected movement between the hindquarters and the tail may be observed in the hyena. Mr. Bartlett informs me that when two of these animals fight together they are mutually conscious of the wonderful power of each other's jaws, and are extremely cautious. They well know that if one of their legs were seized, the bone would instantly be crushed into atoms. Hence they approach each other kneeling, with their legs turned as much as possible inwards, and with their whole bodies bowed so as not to present any salient point, 
the tail at the same time being closely tucked in between the legs. In this attitude they approach each other sideways, or even partly backwards. So again with deer, several of the species, when savage and fighting, tuck in their tails. When one horse in a field tries to bite the hindquarters of another in play, or when a rough boy strikes a donkey from behind, the hindquarters and the tail are drawn in, though it does not appear as if this were done merely to save the tail from being injured. We have also seen the reverse of these movements, for when an animal trots with high elastic steps, the tail is almost always carried aloft. As I have said, when a dog is chased and runs away, he keeps his ears directed backwards but still open, and this is clearly done for the sake of hearing the footsteps of his pursuer. From habit, the ears are often held in the same position, and the tail tucked in, when the danger is obviously in front. I have repeatedly noticed, with a timid terrier of mine, that when she is afraid of some object in front, the nature of which she perfectly knows and does not need to reconnoiter, yet she will for a long time hold her ears and tail in this position, looking the image of discomfort. Discomfort, without any fear, is similarly expressed. Thus, one day I went out of doors, just at the time when this same dog knew that her dinner would be brought. I did not call her, but she wished much to accompany me, and at the same time she wished much for her dinner, and there she stood, first looking one way and then the other, with her tail tucked in and ears drawn back, presenting an unmistakable appearance of perplexed discomfort. Almost all the expressive movements now described, with the exception of the grinning from joy, are innate or instinctive, for they are common to all the individuals, young and old, of all the breeds. Most of them are likewise common to the aboriginal parents of the dog, namely the wolf and jackal, and some of them to other species of the same group. Tamed wolves and jackals, when caressed by their masters, jump about for joy, wag their tails, lower their ears, lick their master's hands, crouch down, and even throw themselves on the ground belly upwards. I have seen a rather fox-like African jackal from the Gaboon depress its ears when caressed. Wolves and jackals, when frightened, certainly tuck in their tails, and a tame jackal has been described as careering round his master in circles and figures of eight, like a dog, with his tail between his legs. It has been stated that foxes, however tame, never display any of the above expressive movements, but this is not strictly accurate. Many years ago I observed in the zoological gardens, and recorded the fact at the time, that a very tame English fox, when caressed by the keeper, wagged its tail, depressed its ears, and then threw itself on the ground belly upwards. The black fox of North America likewise depressed its ears in a slight degree, but I believe that foxes never lick the hands of their masters, and I have been assured that when frightened they never tuck in their tails. If the explanation which I have given of the expression of affection in dogs be admitted, then it would appear that animals which have never been domesticated, namely wolves, jackals, and even foxes, have nevertheless acquired, through the principle of antithesis, certain expressive gestures for it is not probable that these animals, confined in cages, should have learnt them by imitating dogs. Cats I have already described the actions of a cat when feeling savage and not terrified. She assumes a crouching attitude and occasionally protrudes her forefeet with the claws exerted ready for striking. The tail is extended, being curled or lashed from side to side. The hair is not erected, at least it was not so in the few cases observed by me. The ears are drawn closely backwards and the teeth are shown. Low, savage growls are uttered. We can understand why the attitude assumed by a cat when preparing to fight with another cat, or in any way greatly irritated, is so widely different from that of a dog approaching another dog with hostile intentions. For the cat uses her forefeet for striking, and this renders a crouching position convenient or necessary. She is also much more accustomed than a dog to lie concealed and suddenly spring on her prey. No cause can be assigned with certainty for the tail being lashed or curled from side to side. This habit is common to many other animals, for instance to the puma 
when prepared to spring. But it is not common to dogs or to foxes, as I infer from Mr. St. John's account of a fox lying in wait and seizing a hare. We have already seen that some kinds of lizards and various snakes, when excited, rapidly vibrate the tips of their tails. It would appear as if, under strong excitement, there existed an uncontrollable desire for movement of some kind, owing to nerve force being freely liberated from the excited sensorium, and that as the tail is left free, and as its movement does not disturb the general position of the body, it is curled or lashed about. All the movements of a cat, when feeling affectionate, are in complete antithesis to those just described. She now stands upright, with slightly arched back, tail perpendicularly raised, and ears erected, and she rubs her cheeks and flanks against her master or mistress. The desire to rub something is so strong in cats under this state of mind that they may often be seen rubbing themselves against the legs of chairs or tables or against doorposts. This manner of expressing affection probably originated through association, as in the case of dogs, from the mother nursing and fondling her young, and perhaps from the young themselves loving each other and playing together. Another and very different gesture, expressive of pleasure, has already been described, namely the curious manner in which young and even old cats, when pleased, alternately protrude their forefeet with separated toes, as if pushing against and sucking their mother's teats. This habit is so far analogous to that of rubbing against something that both apparently are derived from actions performed during the nursing period. Why cats should show affection by rubbing so much more than do dogs, though the latter delight in contact with their masters, and why cats only occasionally lick the hands of their friends, whilst dogs always do so, I cannot say. Cats cleanse themselves by licking their own coats more regularly than do dogs. On the other hand, their tongues seem less well fitted for the work than the longer and more flexible tongues of dogs. Cats, when terrified, stand at full height and arch their backs in a well-known and ridiculous fashion. They spit, hiss, or growl. The hair over the whole body, and especially on the tail, becomes erect. In the instances observed by me, the basal part of the tail was held upright, the terminal part being thrown on one side. But sometimes the tail is only a little raised and is bent almost from the base to one side. The ears are drawn back and the teeth exposed. When two kittens are playing together, the one often thus tries to frighten the other. From what we have seen in former chapters, all the above points of expression are intelligible, except the extreme arching of the back. I am inclined to believe that, in the same manner as many birds, whilst they ruffle their feathers, spread out their wings and tail, to make themselves look as big as possible, so cats stand upright at their full height, arch their backs, often raise the basal part of the tail, and erect their hair for the same purpose. The lynx, when attacked, is said to arch its back, and is thus figured by Brehm. But the keepers in the zoological gardens have never seen any tendency to this action in the larger feline animals, such as tigers, lions, etc., and these have little cause to be afraid of any other animal. Cats use their voice as much as a means of expression, and they utter, under various emotions and desires, at least six or seven different sounds. The purr of satisfaction, which is made during both inspiration and expiration, is one of the most curious. The puma, cheetah, and ocelot likewise purr, but the tiger, when pleased, Quote, emits a peculiar short snuffle accompanied by the closure of the eyelids, unquote. It is said that the lion, jaguar, and leopard do not purr. Horses Horses, when savage, draw their ears closely back, protrude their heads, and partially uncover their incisor teeth, ready for biting. When inclined to kick behind, they generally, through habit, draw back their ears, and their eyes are turned backwards in a peculiar manner. When pleased, as when some coveted food is brought to them in the stable, they raise and draw in their heads, prick their ears, and look intently towards their friend, often whinny. Impatience is expressed by pawing the ground. The actions of a horse when much startled are highly expressive. One day my horse was much frightened at a drilling machine, covered by a tarpaulin, and lying on an open field. He raised his head so high that his neck became almost perpendicular, 
and this he did from habit, for the machine lay on a slope below, and could not have been seen with more distinctness through the raising of the head, nor, if any sound had proceeded from it, could the sound have been more distinctly heard. His eyes and ears were directed intently forwards, and I could feel through the saddle the palpitations of his heart. With red, dilated nostrils he snorted violently, and whirling round, would have dashed off at full speed had I not prevented him. The distension of the nostrils is not for the sake of scenting the source of danger, for when a horse smells carefully at any object and is not alarmed, he does not dilate his nostrils. Owing to the presence of a valve in the throat, a horse when panting does not breathe through his open mouth, but through his nostrils, and these, consequently, have become endowed with great powers of expansion. This expansion of the nostrils, as well as the snorting, and the palpitations of the heart, are actions which have become firmly associated during a long series of generations with the emotion of terror, for terror has habitually led the horse to the most violent exertion in dashing away at full speed from the cause of danger. End of section 9